want to talk about academia. Now, make sure the doors are closed because that doesn't sound like a, a great topic. Uh, and we have a tortured relationship with our colleges and universities here in the United States. On one hand, people love us. You can tell by the millions of bumper and window stickers proclaiming that somebody went there or, or at least visited the bookstore one time. Um, or you can see the vast gatherings at football games and the number of cups and shirts and shorts and sweatshirts and jackets and flags and mailbox covers and toilet seats and golf bags and even caskets emblazoned with the logos of our schools. No other country in the world has such things. In other places, universities are more like public utilities than the passionate tribes they are in the United States. Places that are pleasant enough, necessary for professional advancement, but hardly the signifiers of identity and class and achievement and vicarious athletic prowess and human worth that they seem to embody in the United States. I'm glad to see Elon's going through the same thing we're going through right now. It's the season of recruitment in which we're doing this elaborate dance of, you come here, we'd love to have you, or we might reject you, but we want you to love us anyway. It would be so much sweeter to reject you if you really want to come here. Uh, or we really, really want you, you're looking at some place, no, come here. And so this is a very elaborate dance that we're doing. I, I've, I've interrupted several tours while I was here today and persuaded people to go to Richmond instead if I could. <laughs> now it could be argued that, you know, and no other place in the world has this complex machinery of mutual selection that we do as well. Now it could be argued that Colleges and universities are America's greatest collective accomplishment other than jazz and rock and roll. They are the source, and basketball, they are the source of much of our country's comparative economic and military advantage, and they serve as the great escalator of social mobility, which is our nation's civic faith, the fact that anybody can make it in this country. Taken as a whole, our nation's system of higher education for community colleges all the way up to Elon may be the most democratic space in America. And yet, despite all this, despite all this love of specific institutions, and despite our undeniable success in building world-class colleges and universities, Americans are suspicious of, disdainful of, neglectful of, and even antagonistic to colleges and universities in general. You can't help but read the, the, the press and just notice, aha, one more way to nail them, whether it's political correctness or fake diversity or high tuition or law schools or whatever. People love to be critical at the same time they want their own sons and daughters to participate in it. Now, I grew up from a, in a distinctly non-academic family and part of the country, and I grew up suspicious of academic life because I knew what a, the academy was like from television and the movies. Therefore, professors on TV were always of two types, pretentious with elbow patches and pipes and sneers and probably an English accent, or nutty with pocket protectors and glasses held together with tape and probably a German accent. And when I was 18, neither was exactly what I was looking for, what, what I, the, the vision I had of myself. And the phrase, that's merely academic, oh, doesn't matter. Any mention of the word academic in a book review is a kiss of death. And a particularly cruel twist, I've noticed, even when a non-academic praises a book by a professor, the interviewer often dismisses the academy in the process. For example, not the boring, self-indulgent, impenetrable, dithering book we always expect from an academic. This book is almost as good as one written by someone who doesn't know anything about the subject. <laughs> now, when asked to identify ourselves out in the community, we almost never say, I'm an academic. You wouldn't want to do that. College teacher is usually pretty good. Professor is okay, even though my son, since he was a small child, whenever I've done something particularly ridiculous, smooth move, professor, um, and uh, it's often used to put somebody in their place, I've noticed that. So I say, oh, I work over at the college uh, when I'm at the tire store or something and just kind of don't really want to get you know, put down too much. And if you're more specific, you can really have real problems. When I'm on an airplane and somebody sees me grading papers, which only an academic would do, uh, they say, oh, you're, you're a teacher. And I, and I say, yeah. They say, oh, what? And I said, history. And I would say 97.3% of the time they say, I always hated history. Uh, <laughs> all those names and dates and <laughs> numbers. And 
I said, I don't know any of those. Uh, but, and I got some notion of this when my mother-in-law, uh, bless her heart, uh, very sweet woman, introduced me to one of her friends. She said, yeah, Ed is a Civil War buff. And I said, well, Sue, no, I'm not a buff because, wait, I don't have another job. I guess it's even worse. That's a, uh, but, and that's, oh well. So, but as, prob as problematic as disciplinary nomenclature can be, if you add academic to it, it makes it even worse. So the title of dean or provost, who knows what a provost does, or president, that sounds kind of scary, kind of faintly militaristic in a way, right? Satisfyingly enough. But even I cringe when I define by, think about defining myself by what I actually am, which is an academic administrator. Uh, it's hard to think of many job descriptions for legally paying work that have more negative connotations of putting those two words together. So you get academic with all the things that we've already talked about, but with administrator, with the rubber stamp and the eye shades and all of that sort of stuff. Now, a lot of skepticism directed, so I know what I'm talking about. I am that. I am an, I'm proud to say I'm an academic administrator and have been for a while now. So you can see why people are suspicious of it, because there's very few positive connotations that go with thinking of working in the academy or being an academic. And I'll have to admit that a lot of this skepticism is not really directed at universities as a whole, but rather about the parts of the universities in which I'm so invested, the liberal arts. People understand why we need law schools or medical schools and schools of business and schools of engineering. But why do we need stuff of the sort to which I have devoted my life? Ancient obscure languages, science that has no immediate use, art and music. We all know the criticisms. It's useless, unprofitable, pointless, self-indulgent, politically correct, nerdy, better left to the private sector. But here's the paradox. While all kinds of occupational majors are proliferating, at the most selective schools, the liberal arts are front and center. The more expensive and selective a school, the more the liberal arts are front and center. The best university shamelessly tells that their largest majors are English and economics and psychology and political science and even history. And most of them don't even have undergraduate business schools. Yet the very best students in the world fight and scratch and claw to get into those schools, and they pay a fortune to go there to major in classics and philosophy and religious studies, or theoretical physics, astronomy, or mathematics. How do we explain this, this kind of inversion that the most privileged people in our country who go to the most privileged schools feel that they can afford to major in the liberal arts? They, I'm sure they have to put up with friends, family who say, the, the, I don't know who handed out this phrase that everybody has to ask, but it's when you always have to put it this way in this language. So what are you going to do with that? Right? Everybody's heard that. I'm not sure what age you are and what major. What are you going to do with that? Why would our best students work so hard to learn things so obviously useless in the so-called real world? Why, in short, do we even need arts and sciences? And that's the question many people ask when they are asking questions about universities. But what they misunderstand what the arts and sciences are. Now, I think most people imagine the arts and sciences like a long buffet table with the arts at one end and the sciences at other. The sciences are sort of the red meat, the protein, right? And then you come into the sort of the carbohydrates of the humanities and social science, and then the puff pastries of the arts at the end, right? And you're supposed to go to college and put together a balanced meal of all these different kinds of things. But that's not what the arts and sciences actually means. It's not what it is. There is an art and there is a science to every discipline. There's an art of conceiving a revolutionary experiment. And there is a science to understanding a poem. And what we are teaching the arts and sciences are those techniques, not how to assemble a good-looking tray. Here's a great quote from 1861 from England that I think nails it. You go to a great school, not for knowledge, so much as for arts and habits, for the habit of attention, for the art of expression, for the art of assuming at a moment's notice a new intellectual posture, for the art of entering quickly into another person's thoughts, for the habit of submitting to censure and refutation, for the art of indicating assent or dissent in graduated terms, for the habit of regarding minute points of accuracy, 
for the habit of working out what is possible in a given time, for taste, for discrimination, for mental courage and mental soberness. That's what the arts and sciences are. That's what we are learning and what we are teaching. And maybe more at the beginning of the 21st century than in the middle of the 19th. It's the liberal arts, the things that Phi Beta Kappa encourages, that teach us how to deal with complexity in all its forms, to trace cause and consequence in ways that don't lead to black, white, on, off, us, them kind of thinking. So Charles has already pointed out that's actually kind of my whole shtick in my scholarship is saying, let's just assume it's complex. Let's don't discover that and then show how it was complex. But that is not the way that our culture encourages people to think. It's like, take a side, defend it. Which channel are you going to watch for the truth? Hurry, get by the other one so you're not polluted by watching any of those, right? Arts and sciences say, nope, you can't think that way. There's nothing worth thinking about for very long that's that simple. The liberal arts teach us how to deal with ambiguity when justice and wisdom are not clearly defined, which is the great majority of the time. The liberal arts teach us to deal with the only constant of the human experience that I've been able to discover, which is the unexpected. What people think is going to happen never does. By developing a supple, broad-ranging understanding, we learn to expect things we don't expect and to keep our heads when they inevitably happen. And the liberal arts teach us to deal with people and beliefs and ideas that are foreign to us. Even if we don't understand the exact nature of someone's religion or political beliefs or self-understanding, the humanities help us understand that they're as fully human as we are. Let's start with that and then try to understand it. I'm not sure where else we're supposed to learn these things. Who else teaches how to think about ambiguity as a core experience of being human. And finally, the liberal arts teach us that the world is full of possibility, that what will be is not merely more of what is, that great leaps are possible, this deep contingency that Charles is talking about. I didn't realize how much this talk was expressing my deepest beliefs, but here it is, that living, growing up in the South, I'm a native of North Carolina, way up in the mountains, not that you can tell from my accent. And grew up in Tennessee, in the segregated South, we thought that's the way things would always be. It changed overnight. I've watched my family, and I know what they thought before because they taught it to me, change their ideas about the possibilities of human interaction suddenly discover that the African-American people among whom they lived were not who they had said. More recently, we've watched as people have changed their ideas about gay and lesbian people with a remarkable speed. And anybody who tells me they saw that coming 20 years ago, I don't believe them because it wasn't. It's pivoted. If we don't understand that things can change I'm not sure what motivation we have for getting out of bed every morning. It's useful for students to understand these things, that the world responds to effort and goodwill and knowledge. Now, those of us in higher education, you see, believe in this oxymoron of institutionalized idealism. We act as if we believe that if we build the right structures with the right principles, we can change individual lives, which in turn make the places those people live and work better. We forget how audacious an idea this is, how ambitious and unsettling. We combine some of the aspirations of religion with human resource management, of families and sports franchises, of small towns and major corporations. That's why there is so much interest in what colleges and universities do. Many people have big stake in our actions, seeing us accurately as reflect, reflections of, of the problems and possibilities of society at large. Questions about our affordability are really questions about social mobility in America. Questions about our diversity are really questions about what is fairness. Questions about our use of technology 
are really questions about the future of human interaction everywhere. Therefore, one phrase I really hate is the ivory tower, that the university is somehow set apart from the society. Instead, we're the place where it all comes together. We're the place, we're the, we're the Petri dish. We're the place where the, 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 all these elements are mixing and combining and seeing what might come out of it. The academy, academia, is not a flight, but a concentration. Therefore, it matters what we say to each other in the academy about our goals and purposes. And lately, we've been speaking in a language that reflects a particular kind of institutionalized idealism, even though it's sometimes hard to hear the idealism beneath the words. So now, we speak of outcomes and competencies and partnerships developed through undergraduate research, service learning, and global citizenship, bringing about community-based, student-centered, and high-impact learning, fostering the values of engagement, responsibility, leadership, and accountability. That's what we believe in. And I, I'm, I know that you folks do as well. And we keep trying to improve more and more, larger and larger parts of the students who come to our colleges and universities. It's not enough that we teach them stuff. We've got to do all those things. And there's one word in particular that we like, experience. We speak easily of direct participation, of involvement, of personal encounter. Our promotional materials boast that you will learn by doing, that you won't just read about it, but experience it. You will gain valuable experience. Lately, we say, get out of the classroom and into the field, city, office, hospital, or wherever the real experience lives. In some ways, we undercut what we're doing. Yeah, we do have a college and university that we built an enormous sacrifice for generations and is excellent, but leave. Go out there and do something. We have these incredible classrooms and teachers, but don't dawdle with us. Go. Another university that I know, their, their motto is, their new motto, a very expensive branding campaign you can see is, make it real. Now we use experience in a rather promiscuous way. Our colleagues in admissions and advancement and the president's office talk with energy and conviction of the unique experience that you can have only here and nowhere else. No other university will give you the experiences that we have. I've been a little shocked to see you have some of the same elements here that we have at the University of Richmond, <laughs> and that people here seem to be happy and learning things and being successful, even though you're not us. I'm not exactly sure how that's happened, but our athletics programs offer a thrilling game day experience. Our multicultural offices demonstrate that people best understand diversity by experiencing. Chaplaincies offer a rich spiritual experience. And our residence halls provide an experience of community or personal freedom, whatever you want. You, like us, are building residence halls. And I've said these words, and that's exactly what we're doing. Now, we've spent enormous amounts of money to enrich that experience. If we look across the expanse of higher education at all kinds of schools, we see that facilities and organizations that foster a full student experience account for much of our investment over recent decades. Student centers, dining centers, fitness centers, recreation centers, career development centers, multicultural centers, and centers for civic engagement have become the centers of student life. I've worked and am working to raise money for such places myself, spaces for a better student experience, and I believe in the work they do. But we're academics, remember, and this is a talk about academia. Therefore, we are supposed to be skeptical maybe especially of the things that we do and believe in. If you hear yourself saying something a lot, you ought to say, well, wait, why are you saying that? Why do we suddenly like the word and practice of experience so much? Should we worry that a cult of experience plays into the narcissistic culture in which college is simply one more experience to be purchased, like a carnival cruise? Come here, we'll give you the full, all the fixings, the buffet, everything else that you need. Does it indulge to students too much to suggest that, hey, all experience is equal? It's all good. Does it shift the focus too much away from the classroom and to every other space on campus? Now, those of us invested in arts and sciences need to be careful 
Experiential learning implies that a classroom or a book or a discussion is not an experience. We've all read books in our field that are vivid and enduring experiences, but we don't talk like that. I remember Faulkner novel more deeply than I do any movie I've ever seen. A lot of times I'm finding that recorded music is a lot better than a concert. And certainly actually seeing people, I've, I've actually stopped watching people in Jimmy Fallon because I find it's always not as cool as just listening to the music. Moreover, faculty and students who pride themselves on learning for its own sake, as the saying goes, are experiencing very real pleasures from that work, a sense of mastery, of connection with tradition, of a broad vision, learning for the joy of learning. The brain, no less than the skin or the tongue or the eyes, feels pleasure. But I think that we've kind of had an idea that for experience to be real, you have to take your body with it, rather than thinking, what could you actually have in your mind? We need to be careful, Phi Beta Kappa fosters this, that we don't lose sight of the utility of the pure passion of learning. America is a very practical country. If we can't see immediate use for it, we're not sure why we're doing it. Except that you can see it in the lives of anybody who's ever done it. One of the great pleasures of my job is I talk to people who've graduated from college 40, 50, 20, 30 years ago. What do they people remember? They remember the faculty. It's a, it's a great discovery I had when I first became dean. They actually remember the classrooms and the books and the discussions. We need to be careful that we don't forget that. T education comes between the lines of a lecture in an ineffable tone and sense of purpose. Something as old-fashioned as this, maybe not this particular instance of it, but a better version of this, a, a lecturer can actually create an experience, even though she's the only one talking in the room, offering a coherent, intentional embodiment of the reason behind the subject, a projection of why the subject matters. A fact is a student can be just as stimulated or bored in a class of 12 or just as border stimulated in front of a computer screen or a lecture. Gifted teachers will use every means they can to touch students, and sometimes words alone are enough. So we need to be sure that we don't get so swept up in all the increasing machinery of academia, as I've said, which I'm out fostering all the time, that we forget of the precious light, sometimes just the flickering of a candle, that's within. I remember walking down the hallway when I was at UVA one time, walked by one room, I could hear them talking about philosophy, another one they were speaking French, and another one they were talking about psychology. And I remembered suddenly my job is to maintain the structure like a nuclear reactor so all those precious and fragile things in those rooms can go on, independent of each other. Nobody sees the whole thing. In some ways, it's an act of faith. But our job is, in academia is to build the, the machine that will allow those very unmachine-like activities to continue to take place. I say this not because I want to devalue experience. I, I promote all those things that I talked about. I'm big on international experience and community engagement, all those things. But I do worry that if we don't promote all that higher education is, including all the arts and sciences, even things that today may not see immediately useful, that we'll have a hard time getting it back. I was dean during a big budget crisis about 10 years ago after 9-11, and some of the board members wanted, Ed, be a man, shut down some stuff. That's what I do in my company. I just shut down stuff. I fire people. Why don't you do it? And I said, well, we don't need all this stuff, do we? Do you? Yeah, and I said, well, you know, four years ago, you would have said, why do you actually need to teach about Islam? Why do you actually need to think about this part? Well, you know, let's, and do, do we need German anymore? Do we need, and that's the whole idea of a university, of the academy, is that we keep alive these things which you never can know when we're going to need it. And if we let it die, you can't get that light lit again. 
So what I'm saying is that the very things that I love, we need to make sure that we don't allow it to overwhelm the other things that I love. Even as we add many possibilities for new experiences, we need to make sure that we don't devalue the core experiences that Phi Beta Kappa and the liberal arts have fostered. All right, all right, you may say, okay, I get it. Teaching is good as the immortal movie uh, <laughs> Everybody knows it about college with John Belushi. Animal House pointed out, I just want to make you all complicit in that, <laughs> pointed out, and I have the scene, I've seen it today, you know, you have a panorama of a place not, not quite as beautiful as Elon, certainly not today, and it's showing college, and it says the, the, the statue of our founder, it starts at his head and it goes down to the motto of the college, knowledge is good. That's pretty much all we think, is that knowledge is good, you know? And I, I'm telling you that, but you can't tell me, you are saying, that yeah, teaching is good, all that's good, but you, the scholarship stuff, research. We know how stupid that is because I've read about it in the paper. They make fun of the titles. <laughs> They're so long. <laughs> those words are multisyllabic. I don't even know what a lot of them mean. That can't be <laughs> useful. And yet, you can't tell me we really need another book on Latin liturgy or some kind of mushroom or postmodern art. You can't tell me that we need these narrow monographs, these articles that 12 people in the world read, these jargon-choked and table-laden theoretical analyses. And yes, I can. You get the right 12 people to read your article, you can change the world. And the idea that everything has to be made instantly accessible to everybody there's something else we need to be careful about. All the conversations going on in university, despite all the specialized vocabularies, walking down that hall and hearing all those conversations, are really part of the same language family. They're all variants of the basic structure. What are they based on? Discipline inquiry, evidence, verification, curiosity, openness, argument, and persuasion. Scholarship is not a retreat from the world, but rather it embodies humans' deeply social nature. Scholarship is written for others in the faith that others will be able to build upon it. And it does require a leap of faith. It's not like here's a report that you owe, that you, my boss, asked me for yesterday about this strategic plan we're doing. This is maybe sometime somebody else will be interested in the role of religion and slavery. That's the great book that Charles Irons has written. I don't know that right now there is a demand for that, but this is an enduring problem. How did people square these fundamental facets of their lives? It embodies our longing, our desperate need to get outside of ourselves, to find a non-parochial truth, to find knowledge that recognizes no boundaries of time. Scholarship embodies humans' longing for things that we can know for sure. Our footnotes and appendices and charts and graphs are not irrelevant. They're anchors that say, this is why I think this, and this is why you could build on this and know this. Our books and articles we dream might outlive us as other books have outlived others. Scholarship, again, is this institutionalized idealism they reflect our apparently hardwired hope that things will get better. Within almost all scholarship lies the utopian dream that if we really, really understand this particular problem of nature, this particular structure of power or domination or injustice or blindness, we'll be able to make life better. So scholars in this weird world of academia I'm describing for you live in two worlds live in a world of print and numbers and imagining and connection with people who wrote books long ago that still speak to us. At the same time, we live in a world of committees and office hours and deadlines and budgets and advising. And the challenge of those of us who live in academia is to move back and forth between these. My wife points out often at red lights that I've slipped into the wrong one. Ed, you're in the 19th century again, aren't you? Yes, honey, I'm sorry. 
The dichotomy between teaching and research is no dichotomy at all if we understand that a professor constantly journeys back and forth between these two worlds, translating among many people. So here's the punchline of all of this. The code of the academy is not based on your skin color or your gender or your name or your religion or your wealth or your standing or anything other than the work itself. Anybody can do great scholarship. Honor lies not in what you appear to be, but in what you, you show yourself to be with a tangible product of your mind and heart. Academics may deserve our reputation as a little bit eccentric, a little bit wobbly, a little bit different. And the world needs more people like that. The world needs more people who can be driven by a passion for something that they know is important but that not everybody can see. These are high ideals, and they're no doubt violated with some regularity. But what we need to remember is that these ideals have survived while many other kinds of institutions have come and gone. Things that seem so real and powerful and enduring have come and gone while these modest institutions of higher learning soldier on generation after generation. They've survived wars and natural disasters and sinful neglect. As you see with Elon, I saw the fire from 1923. Okay? And, and then Phoenix-like rising back up. The University of Richmond lost everything in the Civil War. It too burned down in the 1870s and reborn. What kind of irrational passion drives people to invest in these academic institutions? What other kinds of institutions travel freely across cultures, across vast spaces, across religions? So people can make fun of colleges and universities, of the arts and sciences in particular, all they want. But I guarantee you that the humble scholarly virtues of diligence, of curiosity, of memory, of quiet passion will outlive us all, and we should be glad for that. Thank you very much.